Welcome to episode number seven of the Road to Cinema podcast, featuring director Henry Jaglum. On today's episode, we discuss the making of Easy Rider, the Oscar-winning documentary Hearts and Minds, which chronicles the Vietnam War, and Mr. Jaglum's friendship with the legendary director and actor Orson Welles, which culminated in last year's book, My Lunches with Orson. For more information on the Road to Cinema podcast, to read the Road to Cinema blog, and to watch our Road to Cinema YouTube series, please visit jogroadproductions.com. And now we join Henry Jaglum as he discusses how making a documentary in Israel during the Six-Day War led him to re-edit a four-and-a-half-hour version of Easy Rider into the hour-and-a-half masterpiece we know today, along with actor Jack Nicholson. That defined everything, because, yeah. first of all, I'm very connected to being a Jew, so Israel is very close to me. Half my family are Israelis, so um, I wanted to be there. You know, and it was very difficult to get flights, and it was a complicated thing. And then I figured, I, I want to be a filmmaker someday. I'm, I'm, at that point, I was an actor, guest starring in Gidget and The Flying Nun, and, and <laughs> things that I thought were not necessarily the way I wanted to have my adult life. Psych out, the, I think, was an interesting yeah. turn. <laughs> and, and so uh, I, uh, I decided I'd take a camera with me to see what was going on in this war zone. And I knew I had a lot of friends in the, who were journalists in the Israeli newspapers and in the army, so I could get into the occupied territories. I could get to see things. Uh, so I bought a little camera, but I knew I was technologically... Uh, I'm not just bad, I'm horrible. So I knew that if I tried to use a thing with a zoom lens, for instance, it would be out of focus, because I wouldn't do it right. That was before they were automatic everything. So I bought a little non-zoom lens, 8 millimeter camera, which had 4 minute clips you put into it. And, but you, if you wanted to do a close-up, you had to do this. Yeah. If you wanted to do a wide shot, you had to do that. And I ran around and I made this 5 hour film. Did you have any sound equipment with you at all? No. Silent film. And I did it I, I, I ended up doing what is called, though I never knew it at the time, cutting, um, cutting uh, in the camera, uh, rather than cutting after the fact. You know what I mean? Because yeah. I knew I couldn't, uh, so I go, go up close, cut, and uh, I had a good, young, strong pair of legs. <laughs> so I was running up sand dunes and seeing the Egyptian tanks and then the shoes where the Egyptians and soldiers had left their shoes behind, and then the Israeli kids you know, having a little, and then I was just running down the sand dune, and, you know, and I bored all my friends in Los Angeles with this five-hour uh, thing with, played with Israeli um, martial music, music from ar army music. Uh, and I just, you know, uh, made them listen. And it flowed very well. It was long, it was boring, but it flowed very well. And one of those friends had been my counselor in summer camp, a guy named Bert Schneider. And he was producing a film called Easy Rider. And uh, Dennis Hopper at that point had decided that the film was perfect in four and a half hours and he wasn't going to cut it into, a, into what could be released by Columbia Pictures. Uh, it was perfect, don't touch it. Some French filmmaker had come over and told him that and he agreed. So Bert, having seen what I did with the Israel thing, hired me to come in and work on the editing of Easy Rider. Jack Nicholson and I took adjoining editing rooms. I knew nothing about editing. As I told you, I had done, I, yeah. I was a fraud. So you had never used editing equipment I, I didn't know that. What, I was yeah. a fraud. I, I had done <laughs> everything on my legs. So I, I didn't tell Bert that. He said, you're a good editor. I said, thank you. <laughs> it was just like me running in a close-up and then running you know, back. <laughs> Um, and he's, uh, and there was an editor sitting there with white gloves. Whatever it was, I, I, so he said, well, what would you like? And I'm sitting behind him in my room. Jack's over there. All Jack had said to me is he doesn't want to touch any of his own, all those scenes in the, you know. Campfire. campfire. And, yeah. and I'd seen them, and I know Jack, and I know how much more interesting he is and a lot of stuff that Peter and Dennis were going on about. So I said, there's not enough Jack in there. Is there any way that I can take? Uh, he said, what do you mean any way? I said, well, can I flip somebody over so he's looking in this direction? And I said, yeah, of course. I said, yeah, of course. So would you, I, was lear I learned what I was doing. While I had no idea. And I, I edited uh, about half of the film, Jack, yeah. the other half, both under the supervision 
of um, of uh, Bert Schneider and with Dennis's agreement. How would you say that four and a half version looked compared to what eventually? Uh, Listen, was I, I I went into a room. Yeah, and there were. Uh, at that screening room, there was the big screening room at Columbia. There were 600 people. They were all stoned. It was like the place was a haze of dope. I was the only one, I think, who wasn't stoned. For whatever reason, I wasn't <laughs> stoned. And they thought it was great, and it went ride after ride. So the difference was one, what ended up as one ride in Easy Rider was six rides with like yeah. a musical interlude. Dennis talked and talked and talked in that kind of strange way of his. And you know when I when I did tracks with Dennis, did you ever see that? Yeah, I had the I did the most interesting thing I've ever done in a movie. I went through the entire movie because Dennis, when you encourage him to be spontaneous, speaks the way he speaks. And when he speaks, he spoke. I guess he's dead now. When he spoke, he would say, "Yeah, man, it's like man. If if I want a man, go there, man." So I took out two hundred and sixty three mans. You can do that, and the mouth, the visual doesn't. Betray you, yeah. Because he says if man, he's mumbling or if it's you don't get of, that. So, yeah. I, so I took out 263 mans of his speak to, to get that tremendous performance of him. Um, but in Easy Rider, which was before that, he was just going on and on at these at these things. So I switched a lot of that so that he's looking and Jack is going on and on. Yeah, and uh, that was, in my opinion, my biggest contribution. Though I worked on the uh, because Jack wouldn't work on his own scenes; he didn't want to be seen as. Uh, well, I think it's a great element because you have Dennis Hopper and Peter Fonda, very sort of stoic and but silent. In, but, and in the origi- but, in, but in the original cut, yeah, Dennis and Peter were talking, and Jack was occasionally, you know, it was just that was a big switch for me, for the film. Other than that, I you know I tucked in things, I brought things together, and it, 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 and Dennis was there. You know, it was all under the supervision of Bert Schneider. I learned a lot on that film, though I never would let anybody do that to, to my film. Um, <laughs> What's interesting, you've uh, actually hand edited most of your films. All of my Is that true? Films. All of them. So uh, you learned how to use the editing equipment, do it like well. Have after, you ever switched the digital? Because, because uh, now I have in the yeah. last two or three films. And now, and now I've got an editor who works very much with me, and we're very, very in sync. But it is very—it was hard to give up my cam editing machine. I did the first sixteen films on it, and uh, 17, 17 films on it, and I didn't use an editor or an assistant editor. I was there all night, boxes of the film, putting them on, doing it, cutting it myself, doing all of that. As well as the sound, you... Yeah, that, yeah, all of that. Well, we then will go into labs, you know, for a final thing. We then go into sound editing and... Uh, but, uh, yes, all the original stuff is you put the stripe of sound here, a stripe of film here, and, you know, you... And I love that. It was like sculpting. Orson once said that the thing about me is that uh, I was like this... this Eskimo, he he saw in a in a uh, documentary who was sculpting a big a big walrus tooth, and the the, the 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 guy making the film asked him, "What are you do, What are you making?" Yeah. And the Eskimo looked up bewildered and mm-hmm. said, "I'm trying to find out what's inside." And Orson said, "That's you with me." That was a film he was in. And someone played. He said, "That's you with me, with the other actors, with yourself, always cutting away at us, trying to find out what's inside." So that was a great way to do it on the cam editing machine because you were literally holding the pieces, splicing them, putting the tape together and so on. Now I'm with Ron Vignoni, who's a great editor, but i got to say, can we move that to that and do that? And, here? and he says, yeah, sure. And I say, okay, do it. Yeah. And just sit. So it's a, there is a huge difference, and I do miss that very much. And on the other hand, there are so many things that can be done now and in such speed that I could, that would take months, something that I, uh, you know, I can do in, yeah. in a day and a half. Are you now using uh, digital cameras to shoot your films? Uh, starting this last film, the film that's coming out next. Uh, Ovation. Ovation. Yeah. It was for the first time yeah. shot digitally, which meant to me only one thing. I mean, I used two cameras. What It meant that I could have the actors go on forever. Instead of ten minute clips, which all my mind has always been having to, yeah. you know, get it in within ten minutes. Probably to the expense of film and developing. Uh, no, no, because film, film is either four hundred feet mags 
or a thousand feet max, which means you know you got four or ten minutes, and then you got to reload. So the actors have to stop. With what's great, what's great about this is that I can just say to me, you know, okay, start, and then I can let them go for thirty minutes, yeah, and film it all and get two minutes that I want out of it. And the actors never have to lose that, you know, that moment. That involvement. Yeah. That's right. It's a, a huge difference in terms of what you can get in performance. Yeah. Uh, so I was wondering about uh, Bert Schneider. He gave you sort of your first opportunity to direct he, a feature film. He did the and, most uh, amazing thing. You guys were also involved in Hearts and Minds, which must be like probably one of the greatest documentaries ever made. Mm. Uh, so I was wondering if you could talk a little about... Uh, he was the guy responsible for the whole new wave in Hollywood. If it weren't yeah. for him, Scorsese and, and uh, Francis Coppola and other people would never have come about... Uh, he opened up the doors to independent people making films for studios. Columbia Pictures gave him the opportunity. Any, a million then was like 10, say, or 12 now. And he, they'd give him a million dollars for eight films, and each film cost a million. So he would give the filmmaker the chance uh, to make that film, and he got Five Easy Pieces, Last Picture Show, uh, um, Marvin Garden, Easy Rider, yeah. King of Marvin Gardens, uh, all, you know, uh, A Safe Place, and so on, Gave, giving us all a chance. The biggest thing about him, though, as opposed to the experience on Easy Rider, where we all sat with Dennis, and then Dennis didn't want to cut, you know, saw it as perfect, so I was assigned along with Jack to whittle it down. When he saw my film, the, you know, the, yeah, safe place, the safe place. He looked at it. He was and he was crying at the end. So I thought, oh, great, <laughs> I got him. I was crying. I said, oh, he said, I said that's. I like seeing that reaction. He said the only person more indulgent in the world than you in having made this film is me because I'm going to let you. I'm not going to cut it. I'm not going to try to do what we did with Easy Rider. I'm not going to even... I have no idea how to do that. It's going to lose every penny it cost. No audiences won't understand this. Because it's all in the mind of a young girl. Have you seen it, A Safe Place? Yeah. You know, It's a very abstract, poetic film to be made by a studio. It was, it was, it was a weird fix. But he, he, he gave me, essentially, final cut. And... When we sh- when we screened it first at the New York Film Festival, half the audience went crazy for it, and half booed and hissed, and really couldn't stand it. And it was a huge like thing. And Jack Nicholson said then what was true, which was okay, we should pull this from release, dub the whole thing in French. Nobody knows who I am yet. Call me Henri Jaglom, and release it as a new French filmmaker making a film. He said. They'll go for it. They'll love it. it it's in a good, like Godard and like you know all that. Yeah. Um, and he was right. The audience was not prepared for an American film. That now I'm getting forty years later some pretty damn good reviews. But if it wasn't for Anais Nin, uh, you know about that. Yeah, she wrote an article about uh, it right print, after that and praised the film and got it. it. Uh, printed it in yeah. every counterculture as there were then newspaper. And suddenly the audience of young women and took a 16 millimeter print of it on college campuses to these women's groups that she talked to yeah. and showed it, took my name off, like Jack suggested, didn't say, but just didn't say who had made it till the end. Yeah. They were all sure a woman had made it because it was a portrait of a, w- a woman's emotional life. It, she then told them that it was a man. And, about, and so the film, which was playing in a small theater here in Los Angeles and in New York, started having young women coming to it. And that started my audience and led me to all what I'm doing, which is making films 60%, I don't know, 70% you know, about women or about men who really like and are interested in women's lives. Uh, it, it, it seemed to me at that point, oh, I get it. Nobody's making films in Hollywood. It's like these boy babies are making films for little teenage or preteen boys out in the Midwest. Yeah. And nobody's making adult films, especially not about women's lives. Uh, Bert Schneider allowed me, by, by not doing what he'd done with every other film he produced, he just said, I can't figure this out. And I said, well, why are you letting me do this? <laughs> and he said, it made me cry. He said, I, I, don't, I think it, nobody will understand it. I don't understand it. I don't, it'll, yeah. it, won't, it won't make a penny, but it made me cry. That's what... He was this. He kind believed of, in he the filmmaker, he, he was, and he uh, trusted himself. Yeah, he didn't do tests with audiences. He didn't go out. He was fantastic, and um, I always wondered why he uh, for life. <laughs> really, 
I always wondered why he never continued to produce films and have a company and really drugs. You know, was that uh, Just cocaine and uh, becoming crazy behind it? That's really why. Mm-hmm. Fucked up. Um, saddest. If I, I I've, I've often said that if I were F. Scott Fitzgerald and could write like that, yeah, uh, I would. The great Hollywood novel would be Bert Schneider. The rise and fall. He had been my counselor in summer camp. So that means when I was five, six, and seven, he was this guy I looked up to. My, I had a goofy older brother who's the same, was the same age as he was. Michael Emil. Michael Emil. Yeah. <laughs> uh, who I've used to be the goofy guy he is. Sitting ducks and, and, uh, and so many. And <laughs> um, which was Jack's idea, using him. Nicholson said to me when he met my brother, You've got gold here. Just put them on the screen, they'll laugh, you know. So. But I wasn't too happy having my brother when I was five, six, seven, eight, because my brother was this weird goofball with a German accent, and the kids called him Hitler. It was during World War II. And he had this hair, blonde hair coming down. Anyway, and Bert was the all-American boy, this gorgeous blonde athlete. Too. And, and um, His father was Abe Schneider. Yeah, who, uh, ran all that meant to us was we got all the movies. I, I remember sitting at night uh, outside a huge... Huge tent. This must have. Been, I must have been six. And uh, the movie is the ape. What is that ape? Oh, King Kong. King. Yeah, King Kong. <laughs> when you're six, sitting outside with a gigantic sheet and two boxes where sounds coming from. I'll never forget that experience. And we did that. We got that and others because his father was Abe Schneider. So we got yeah. the films from. Uh, I don't know where I, where I was going. Oh, about. Uh, Sort of why Bert Schneider never continues. Well, yeah. yeah. So he, I, you know, he was the man I was closest to in my life. Anybody other than my father and my brother. And uh, when I had come out here, we became very, very close. And he, yeah. as he let me direct the movie, and then he let me. He released it without making me even try to make it commercial, which was against his own interest. You know, uh, uh, he knew it was going to be a huge failure commercially. And, and his reasoning was that simple emotional, which people don't do in this town, it made me cry. Yeah. So um, he, he got more and more into politics of an extreme left-wing kind. He financed Huey Newton and the Black Panthers. He financed our... Did he help him uh, flee to Cuba? That was like a story I read. No, 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 I can simply yeah. say yes to <laughs> For years I said... It's not for me to say. Yes, yes, he did. Yeah, I read in, uh, I think it was Variety or Deadline, I guess they're developing a film based on how he helped you and your own, uh, yeah, some uh, companies no in uh, production on that. <laughs> no kidding. Artie Ross, a friend of ours, had a little uh, ship, boat, what are they called, sail thing, and took uh, Huey to Cuba. Wow. He's dead now, so we can talk about that. <laughs> Uh, and he was dead, of course. Um, Bert got more and more into left, not just left, but extreme left uh, not, uh, politics. We got into huge arguments about Israel, for instance, uh, which is, uh, as I mentioned earlier, a very huge part of me. Well, is it true that at the the, uh, the Cannes Film Festival, uh, Columbia Pictures sort of chopped off the logo on the film print of Hearts and Minds when it was about to... Uh be projected like they were so adamant against distributing the film. Who was adamant against distributing? The film? Oh, Columbia Pictures. No, no, I don't no. know where you heard that. What happened was uh, was that Columbia Pictures refused, period, yeah. to show it or to have anything to do with it, it yeah. because people in the government, including the defense secretary, had seen it and had said it was an insult to American troops and all this stuff, and so Columbia wouldn't release it. And it uh, it had cost them a million dollars under under Bert's deal. That was the first time they did that. And Warner Brothers said, "We'll release it. We think it's a great film." But um, somebody had to pay Columbia a million dollars back to get the film from them to give it to Warner Brothers. Yeah. Zach Norman, do you know who that is? Uh, he helped you produce tracks originally. An actor in many of my films. Yeah. A weird, fast-talking, funny, bald <laughs> guy with a mustache who plays with my brother in Sitting Ducks, if you remember who he is. Yeah. He 
he had gone to doctors and dentists and all these people to raise money for tracks because after a safe place nobody would finance me and um, he so he, there was a tax deal then that you could write off I think six to one or seven to one if you invested in film you could one dollar you could write off six they did it for the oil industry cattle I think and films and he raised a million dollars to make tracks my second film after three years of my trying to get it made within the system and failing um, so we had that million dollars to make tracks so Bert said to me can we use your million dollars and he'd given me a safe place and everything else and I believed in, very much in Hearts and Minds which was the, the film we we're talking yeah. about it eventually won an Academy Award it did win yeah. an Academy Award I, it's in my name that Academy Award mine and Zach because we're the, we are the the, 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 what are the we, we are the presenters of that film not the producer that's Bert we're the presenters that it was given to um, and we distribute it by the way now ironically yes. it's our company Rainbow but um, I said I went to Zach who's not a political person at all not no consciousness in that area he's a hustling guy <laughs> nice guy good heart but I said I want to give this to uh this million that you've spent two years raising to, to Bert so he can buy this film from, from uh, Columbia and have Warner Brothers release. He said, okay. And he started going out trying to raise it again for me for tracks. Took another year. Managed only a half a million. But there was enough for me to make the movie. Yeah. But we got that. And that's how we bought it away from Columbia. So they never refused it. They just, I mean, they never refused to show it or something. They wouldn't. I don't know what you said about Can. They were not involved. Oh, something like they cut off the uh, the logo from they, the film. Print the logo was taken there. off because Warner Brothers yeah. bought the film. So, so it's a Warner Brothers release. Yeah. And uh, there was that famous uh, Academy Award speech that I guess Bert Schneider gave up. Thanking the Viet Cong. It's very controversial. Reading a letter from the Viet Cong. Sinatra got pissed off. Bob Hope. Yeah. Did uh, he ever talk to you about the backlash from oh, that, or was that talk. traumatic to him at all? As no, far no, as it wasn't uh, traumatic, he loved it. Yeah, he was a fighter. That's what he believed in, and he was yeah. passionate about it. Yeah. Yeah. We, all, we all were. I mean, I, Jane Fonda and I were in a, a group, ran a group uh, called the Entertainment Industry for Peace and Justice, and we were sending out shows to, to, for the army. It was also called. It was called. The free the army, but it's also fuck the army. It was a, a F, F, FTA, and we were sending out shows to to venues like clubs or whatever near the bases where the army were to counter the Bob Hope pro war shows that were coming, yeah. and getting more and more people, soldiers involved in counter uh, in getting undermining their attraction to the war and so on. Uh, but how do we get to Jane? Uh, Oh, from about the uh, Oscar speech. Yeah, but she wasn't involved oh, yeah. in that. Yeah. Anyway, but but yes, the two, my two heroes, Sinatra and Bob Hope, my childhood, both got incredibly, insanely furious. It's kind of ironic since they're Academy members, and you know, it's sort of like the Academy voted for Hearts and Minds. Yet there was that. Yeah, but yeah. that was uh, that was uh, despite the older more conservative members the academy had just begun to break the age barrier yeah. and uh, we didn't expect to win because of that but it's also such Peter Davis who's really the artist behind this film the director it made such a great film you yeah. have you seen it? yeah it's a powerful movie yeah. uh, Criterion came out with a DVD or a Blu-ray we, we uh, release recently. it we, we are the ones who distribute that film oh it's through uh, and you work with Criterion and well we yeah, let yeah. Criterion do that no, it's a beautiful print of the movie. Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. Uh, so I was wondering, you have a very interesting setup where you uh, you do production, you distribute your own films. Yeah. Uh, Sometimes it's much easier and happy if we don't have to. If somebody comes along and who we think, I mean, Paramount gave us a million dollars for uh, a festival in Cannes, which cost me four hundred thousand. So that was a very good deal. Uh, Samuel uh, Goldwyn gave us a, a million also for a film that cost three hundred. Uh, um, Always. Oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> I do my research. Do your research. <laughs> my father finally said, "Now, finally, it's this is that's a, you, you got a business." 
Yeah. When you, make, <laughs> when you make something for 300,000 and you get a million, that's a profit. That's a business, yeah. You never under, but, but you know what I did on Easy Rider? Before all, selling them, before becoming a director, I was given a choice by Bert. Do you want $1,000 a week? Just to me, it was, what? It's fucking great. $1,000 a week? I, I, you know, I had been an actor under contract to, to Screen Gems when I did, you know, Easy Rider. Flying, Flying Nine. Flying Nine and Gidget yeah. and all that. And they gave me 500 a week, and here was 1000 a week for having fun cutting, you know. Um, and I said, sure. He said, or I can give you um, a half a point of the picture. So I talked to my father, who's a very successful businessman. He said, a half a point of nothing is nothing. Film doesn't make money. If they really are going to give you 1000 you're finally doing something in this business, right? For eight weeks, that means 8000 That's real money. So I took that. The secretary to Bert, who had the same offer and chose to have a half a percent, retired afterwards with, and had made, has made a total, I think it is, of $820,000 wow. under 1%. Bought a house, <laughs> retired, you know. So, and I go to my father and say, <laughs> like this, he says, it's still the right choice because how often is it going to be something like that? Yeah, it was I think that movie was made for, what, like under a million and it made oh, like under a million, fifth, or a few three. hundred thousand? Yeah. yeah. In that area, 250,000. And it's still making, you know, it's a gigantic hit. But. Do you ever do, uh, like, foreign pre-sales to finance your films? We have. Or? We have. Yeah. We did a lot. You know, it used to be a lot more. Going to different territories. And I used to go to Cannes every year. And and, uh, and actually, by the time I came back, I was even. Whatever the film it cost, I got more at the Cannes. For, for what is that? Who? <laughs> uh, yeah. Now it's become harder because of the, the crash of DVDs. Uh, but but now there are other outlets, all kinds of outlets. Was it sort of iTunes, Netflix, well, we're uh, on Amazon? We're on all of that, all of our films, yeah. And now it's interesting, a lot of independent films uh, distribute, like even just primarily digitally, sort of on iTunes mm-hmm. first week. Uh, is that something that you're always conscious of, how the digital world we is helping be, yeah. Yeah. independent filmmakers? Yeah, sure. It's Sharon's department, mostly. <laughs> Distribution. Uh, so uh, the book that came out last, uh, last year, uh, My Lunches with Orson, yeah. uh, so you had had these tapes for what, maybe about 30 years. More uh, than 30, yeah. We, we made, 85 was the last, was when Orson died. So what is that? Uh, how many years ago? Uh, 20... 15, so it's 29 years. Yeah. yeah. And we've done those lunches for about five years. I still have a lot of tapes from dinners, which I didn't even give them. And they've been, these, those tapes were sitting in a, in, a, in a box in my office for years. I never thought of, I never listened to them. Very clanky sound, bad sound, you know, because I had made them. Uh, Orson had wanted to write his autobiography. Do you know the story about how they came to Yeah, he yeah. wanted to write his autobiography. In sometime in the future, when he was too old, he said, to make movies. But yeah. he was afraid he was going to forget. He was beginning to forget a lot. So of he stuff. said, just say, record, record when, our, when we're talking. Well, we're talking, but yeah. do it in an inconspicuous way so I'm not self-conscious. And I always carried a black bag then. And he said, stick it with that apparatus and have it out of there. And that's what I did. And um, I never thought about it after he died, and I just left them there. And a couple. Did of you years. ever listen to the tapes no. again? No. no. Um, and I uh, no, because they were very firm in my mind. It was, it was a great, great thing in my life. It's that friendship. And um, he, he, but uh, uh, different people had come to me and said, "You should make a book out of this." I said, "I don't want to. It's not what I do. I don't know." And then my Peter. Uh, Biscuit, who's a friend of mine, uh, because we got into, he, he, we met when he did um, uh, Easy Riders, Raging Bulls, and he interviewed me, and and I had done something rather risky with him. Then I gave him access to I have journals from forty years, very personal, detailed journals of everything. Uh, I used to write every night and um, about everything, and I gave him access to the journals and said, "You, you tell me what you can use for this, you know, uh, for the seventies for your book." Uh, easy riders, raging bulls. Yeah, uh, I'll tell you if it's okay to use it. Is that a deal that you won't use it if I tell you it's not okay? He said yes. So we did that, and he was true to his word, which is a he strange. never used anything that he didn't approve of. He begged me a couple of times for certain <laughs> things. I said no, I won't. You know that's about so and so, and I don't want that. And he never crossed that line, so I knew I could trust him. 
and uh, that's why that's why uh, that's why I gave him the right to. And also, he was prepared to have all the books transcribed, read through them all. I mean, dude, he did a year and a half. So he listened to every tape, every single he tape. Would transcribe it, and he, then he had, it no, down had a transcriber. He had a separate transcriber. Okay. Yeah, people who do that for a living. Yeah, and then he read all the transcriptions and listened. I mean, it's a job. It's an incredible job. And and then edited it into the, what it is, and it's good. It's fabulous. It's yeah. like you read it. It just feels like you're you're it's, at the t- like you're a fly on the wall. Like you're just there it's and, and experience. Yeah, and it totally captures the truth of the experience. I mean, it feels exactly like it felt being with Orson. And it brought back so many wonderful things about him for me. Was there anything surprising to you when you read the book, as far as something that sort of took you off guard that you had forgotten that you had spoken to Orson about, or that really uh, was profound? No, I lost a friend because of it. I lost a very, very good friend. Peter Bogdanovich was my closest friend probably over for 50 years. And when Maureen Dowd reviewed the book, uh, on the front page of the book review section, she, she chose, I don't know her personally, she, cho- she chose to write that Henry Jaglom was a mensch. She used the word mensch as opposed to Peter Bogdanovich in how he tried to help Orson Welles. Yeah. And that was on the front page. And I think I think that's what did it, because Peter hasn't won't answer my emails and hasn't spoken to me, and we were so close. He was at my house. He stayed in my New York apartment. I had a house out here where he stayed, and so on. So I lost. The, I, I learned something about that. You know, you read about that in st- stories. Yeah. But I never had had anything like that. I was Orson surprised. said some very unpleasant things. Yeah, I was about a little it. surprised uh, what Orson had to say about Peter Bogdanovich because I always had this impression that they that's were great right. friends. That's and there right. was that book that was written. That's, yeah, that's, that's what, and they were. And he was, and a lot of it's unfair because Peter was very good to Orson and let him stay in his house. Uh, Tried to help him get movies off the ground. Mm, that, that's where it got there. iffy. Yeah. And I think what happened was mainly that there was a movie that Orson wanted to make, Nickelodeon, about early movies. Peter said he was going to help him get financing. He didn't. Maybe he couldn't. And then he ended up making the movie himself. I think that was the turning thing. All I knew was he was still my friend, and I was always defending him against Orson in these lunches. But, uh, you know, that's the, that was the only... Price I've paid so far, negatively. Everything else has been great about the book, but I'm sad. I'm sad about that because I really was so close to Peter. We were both teenagers when we met, and we were fighting always. He he was booking the theater called the New Yorker in New York. He was booking old Hollywood movies, John Ford movies, yeah. and, and and I was into uh, Godard and Fellini and Truffaut and you know Ingmar Bergman and the new wave of British filmmakers, and, and he, he said everything good has been made in Hollywood before 1940. You're the first person I've actually told that to. I'm sort of sad about it. And I've written him, I've sent him, I, I, I talked on NPR and other interviews about the fact that Orson was unfair. Uh, you know, he was, he was old, he was angry, he was hurt. It wasn't fair because Peter really did help him a lot. But Nickelodeon, I think, was the big, that big thing that... Uh, yeah. And there's that remember. great interview, uh, I guess, A Safe Place and The Last Picture Show came out around the same time, same and uh, I think Molly Haskell had interviewed the two, the two of you, of it was us. a great interview, I think yeah. it's on YouTube as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We were tremendous friends, also, I mean, uh, until, look, he was every New Year's Eve party at my house, every 4th of July. Yeah. Um, uh, he was in Festival in Cannes, He was in I think. several yeah. of my films, uh, Festival Queen of the Lot. Yeah. Queen of the Lot, that's right. And uh, I've always, you know, anyway, uh, that's yeah. the sadness that you read about and you, don't, you never think that's going to happen, you know, with people you know really well. Yeah. But this was, this meant, and I, I'm only guessing, because she, he won't talk to me, I'm only guessing that the reason is not so much what Orson says about him in the book, but the way that uh, she, she re- re- said that thing on the front page of the, of the book review section, which everybody in the world reads. and. Yes. Which was a nice thing to say about me, but not a nice thing for Peter. Yeah. I think his whole reputation has been, I mean, a huge part of it has been the spokesperson for the Orson thing. Yeah, whatever interview you and see, here, it's Orson always, cares uh, You read the book, right? Yeah, it's, so. it's 
brutal it's sometimes you know, yeah. to read that. Yeah. Just because, you know, I read the other uh, uh-huh. Peter Bogdanovich book uh-huh. and you see their rapport. The so. big difference also in that book is that um, Orson edited it. After Peter wrote it, he gave it to Orson, and Orson edited it out, and Orson loved to edit his own, you know, edited it out all the stuff he didn't like and changed it, and Peter let that happen. Now, this book, Orson's dead. Yeah. He couldn't, I never could have gotten away with letting those things out if he had been alive. He's dead. And I just said, I left his words intact exactly as they were. Um, so you really get to know Orson in this book. In Peter's book, you get to know his work ideas really well yeah, and his process his and process theater, right, and by his work I did his process yeah. it's, it's, in a, it's a great book because but, but you don't get to know him personally at all because there he's on guard and there he's you know protecting himself and also he's editing a little bit all, all along but about the work it's absolutely a great book yeah. uh, among your, your friendship with Orson that went on for many years uh, what do you think you miss most about Orson uh, your friendship and also maybe even filmmaking advice that he gave you? What a great question. I don't know. Um, lunches. Yeah. That's what I miss. I miss <laughs> the fact that you never knew what was going to happen. Um, I like driving around with him and him showing me things. This is where such and such, this is where Rita and I lived and, you know, the, we had an incredible time at the Cannes Film in Paris, first of all, where I testified in this court thing for him to try to get the other side of the wind out. And then in Cannes, in Cannes I brought him there because they wanted to uh, have him present the main award. Yeah. And I had a film there at the time, uh, Kinship Cherry Pie, which he had helped me work on the editing and had fun with. <coughs> and I wanted to show the world that he was ambulatory, you know, so we hid the wheelchair but he really used a lot to get around and put him uh, set him down on the hill near the hotel and uh, everybody flocked to him and it was a great way of uh, showing them he's back he's ready and we were trying to raise money all over the place as you could tell in that book yeah. and it kept looking like we were going to get it from the French or we were going to get it from this family or we were going to get it from that and it was always interesting in the book like at the end of maybe at the end of each chapter he would be so close to getting financing and then suddenly it would just yeah, go the other way yeah but remember what he said one, once I was so convinced this guy I knew really well had just produced um, what is that Peter Sellers film uh, uh you know about the guy who's a sort of retarded but becomes oh uh, uh, being there the Hal Ashby being, being uh, house. yeah uh, and um, Brown Andy Brownsburg is the guy's name who produced that film so he was in a great shot he just produced the Academy Award winning film everybody wanted to come to lunch with Orson so I would say sure sure and I'd arrange lunches and not, nobody helped nobody helped they just came to lunch and talked and got him to talk and Brownsburg said well what do you got and I said he's written this new movie I've got him to write this it's like a bookend to Citizen Kane about the end of the century the way that Kane was about the beginning of the century it's called The Other Side of the Wind uh, and he said you got a deal I said really he said yeah I'm not going I don't have to read it what's the budget da 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 you got a deal and he went off and I said Orson let's open up a bottle of Cristal champagne <laughs> because I've never heard those words before uh, and he said, next week it'll all be together. you got to deal next week. And Orson said, if you knew how many next weeks there have been in the last 20 years, uh, it was very heartbreaking. If you yeah. knew how many next weeks there have been, he said, we'll wait with the champagne until something happens, and nothing happened. The guy disappeared. Just, Just kind of a metaphor for the movie business, you know, in general. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. It really is. And I thought for sure, I'm not, I'm, I'm a little cynical, but I'm not, you know, steeped enough in it because I've stayed away I've kept my own world it's like uh, such a nightmare everybody wanted to have lunch with him every Spielberg everybody and then nobody helped And you know people there's so many ways they could have helped anyway yeah. that time that phrase does it say in the book that thing about his phone call to me about his his, his tomb his, his grave what he uh, wanted on his grave 
No, not not that I can he remember. He called me up. I just never forgot that. I don't know why it just occurred to me. He calls me up one day, one night, three in the morning, and he says, "Do you have a pencil?" I said, "Orson, it's three in the morning." He said, "I know. Do you have a pencil?" I said, "Okay. What is it?" He said, "I know what I want on my gravestone." I said, "What? Don't be depressing. Don't be morbid. Go back to sleep." I said, "No. I want you to write this down. I know what I want on my gravestone." I said, "Okay." He said, "Do you have a pencil?" "Yes." "Do you have a piece of paper?" "Yes." Okay, write this. He never did Love Boat. <laughs> and I had been working, he had had me working to raise the money on Love Boat had offered him. I had gotten them triple by talking, pretending to be his agent. And I was depressed about it because I didn't want him to do Love Boat. But, but he could use that money and put it money toward for the film. So I didn't say anything. And then he called, he, middle of the night, calls me up. And that's what I wanted my grade. He never did Love Boat. <laughs> so uh, I always wondered the other side of the wind uh, there were some like clips on YouTube of the film that came out I think one was like you and uh, Paul Mazursky yeah. Uh, yeah. talking uh, I had that for a while unless they took it off I don't know what. yeah it's amazing did uh, listen I've heard so many <laughs> as many stories as you have yeah. Peter used to talk about it that he was going to uh, he was trying to get the together. film out of uh, he needed a million dollars to get the film to edit it into uh, you know I heard all these stories, and it was going to be next year. It was going to be next year. Nothing's ever happened that I know of. Yeah, I don't know even who where that stuff started on uh, on Facebook. I was very happy to see it. I wish I. I mean, I. Or yeah, no, it was fascinating to watch those clips. Me and Zersky were there. It was very <laughs> funny. Stuff. That was a great conversation you guys had. It was yeah. like you know you had one point of view on filmmaking Completely and everything else, yeah. and Orson set that up purposely for us to get into a big argument. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I can't remember the last uh, I forgot the name of the film but uh, there was a script that I guess Orson had written that Arnon Milshan was going to finance yeah, uh, but that's, that is exactly I read the screenplay of it which is you know, very good uh, it would have been much better as a film Orson yeah. the screenplays were always his guidelines um, yeah um, the name escapes me for the big brass ring big brass ring yeah and, um, Which I guess you had kind of motivated him to, he to said, write. He said, I can't time. write anymore. Yeah. Because after I went and found that I couldn't sell any of, I couldn't sell any deal with him directing any of, any of the, um, he wanted to do King Lear, he wanted to do this, uh, the immortal story, this different things. They said, if we get a new Orson Welles thing, like one of his great scripts, then, he said, I can't write anymore, I can't write anymore. And then one morning, three in the morning, also at four o'clock, a phone call. I've written four pages, but they're terrible. And I said, well, read them to me, and they were great. And, and he didn't believe me, and he hung up. And the next day, at lunch, I said, I want four more. And slowly, he wrote this terrific thing. And uh, and everybody said they needed a new thing from him. They weren't brand. And then I took it to every studio head and everybody... And finally, Arnon came along and said, okay, I'll do it if I can get one of these seven actors, stars. And much to my horror, each one of those people, one by one, turned Orson down. Each one of whom, Orson was a mythical figure of great, you know, dream honor and everything. That was really, you know, that was really, really a huge crushing thing for him. Which was another sort of close call to, to get that There was always finance, close calls. Yeah. And, I, and I, I saw my job as to... Uh, as he's about to fall, pick him up again, give him some hope again, and um, uh, and there were great times of hopefulness and joy, and looks like it's going to happen. Yeah. And uh, you know, the truth of what he'd said to me earlier kept coming back to me. That he'd said to me once about myself. Get your financing as far. I started going to Europe and getting financing after my friend Zach had raised the money for tracks, and you know, I figured I started seeing what I could do because I couldn't do it here anymore. And I found out you can get twenty thousand from this, forty thousand, eighty thousand, especially in the time of, of uh, uh, you know, DVDs. What were they called before? Oh, uh, VHS uh, video tapes. Video tapes. Yeah. And. Um, so you always said, get your money away from Hollywood because they can take your toys away. Yeah, they can just stop it like they did mine. What's great now with the digital technology, the, uh, the auspices to make a film are it's incredible. so simple yeah, and incredible. streamlined. It changes everything. Of course, I've been alive today. Oh, I'd hate to. It's so it's so sad because he would have been God. He would have been all over it, all over. Yeah. It. 
Uh, so I was wondering if you could talk a little about uh, the M word. And, well, uh, my pleasure. Uh, for this film, uh, it seemed to me nobody had made a real film about menopause. Uh, it's a subject that embarrasses most men. They don't know what quite to talk, how to talk about it. And uh, I knew all these women of a certain age who were beginning to talk about that or have things going on. And so I, I thought, well, I'll try to make that into a, th- a comedy and then about a few other things, you know. Um, and that's that was the genesis of this. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, there's a few names uh, that I wanted to kind of throw out there that I knew you kind of worked with uh, okay. early on in your careers. Uh, one is Larry David, uh, who was well, in that was just, Bake Baker Cherry Pie. Yeah, that's his first film. <laughs> How did you uh, come about seeing we, Larry We hung David? out was together that, uh, at the cafe that, it, that is the heart of uh, Kenshi Baker Cherry Pie. It was a real yeah. cafe, uh, Cafe Central, and we everybody hung out there show business wannabes, people who were actors or wanted to be or were starting out. And I knew him there like I knew a lot of people. And I said, hey, throw you in the scene. He yeah. said, okay. <laughs> Turned out to be his first movie, yeah. Yeah, I mean, he's a great improviser, and that's his whole process yeah. of Curb Your Enthusiasm. Yeah, which so. I love. I love his work. Love his work. Yeah. It was a great show. And then uh, another name is Melissa Leo, who was in OA. She was walking on Last stilts. In the Hamptons. She was walking on stilts to advertise something in front of the New York Public Library on 42nd Street. Stilt walking, that's how she was making her living. But again, at the same cafe, I met her. And I thought there was something special, and I cast her as as my wife's sister in the film about the end of my first marriage, always. And I've been using her ever since. Yeah, last summer in the Hamptons, and... uh, Oh, many, yeah. 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 She won an Oscar a few years ago, which is you know incredible in the fighter. Yeah, yeah, she's had a great, a great upsurge in her career. Yeah. Uh, and then another uh, John Robin Bates, who was in Last Robin, Summer in the Hamptons, yeah. and uh, I guess a couple other. Uh, no, you know, was, oh yeah, one other. That's uh, right. That's right. Hollywood Dreams. Yeah, where he's yeah. a playwright. Yeah, Robbie is a friend of mine. Uh, again, who never acted, and I needed a character to play the gay character. And Robbie's gay and comfortable with his gayness in terms of uh, not minding, not you know, just being healthy about it. And he um, liked the idea of what I was trying to do in that film. And so uh, I said, "Well, why don't you play it?" He said, "I can't act. I'm not an actor." I said, "Good. That's that's those are the kind of people I like." <laughs> and he did a great job. He did a really terrific job. I thank Robbie. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, incredible writing, playwright. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. I mean, he, he. I went to his pre- openings in New York. He keeps. I keep getting emails saying, "When are you going to? What's the next movie for me?" <laughs> you know. Uh, he, yeah, he's, he was very good as Melissa's sister, a brother, as Melissa's brother in that. Definitely, yeah, it's very natural. Sometimes it's good to have people who aren't necessarily actors, exactly, because they don't have that thing in their mind where it's like I have to perform, either, I have to show either off. They're, if they're really good actors, they don't have the thing. Yeah. Or if they're real people. The great thing about my brother was he never had that thing because he never thinks of himself as an actor. Yeah. Same with Zach. You know? I even thought uh, Bob Rafelson in Always. Same was, thing. You know, he had that yeah. just shine yeah. right there. <laughs> yeah, because he was like, I don't have to do anything. I just have to be Bob Rafelson. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's true. And Robbie just said, what do I do? I said, you're Robbie. And he would give you another name. Yeah. This is the circumstance. You've got a sister. You've had a little incestuous thing going on. Okay, you think you can play that? So uh, it, it was—it's uh, fun because you can take people, take elements of their life, l- allow them to really use those, and not worry about the traditional concepts of can this person act or not act. Yeah, but, or if they're playing like a character, you know, you're just sort of bringing out what's in them. Yeah, I, 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 the, the character should be, in my opinion, unless they're enormously skilled actors, and I'm less interested in that characters close to something emotionally about them that you can then work on and bring out and that's relevant to the story that you're trying to tell yeah like michael imperioli is an extraordinary actor and like everybody else he's in uh, the m-word yeah yeah you haven't seen that uh not yet but the DVD. like everybody else <laughs> oh, oh that's right yeah like everybody else uh, uh, who comes to this process he was like every other solid actor i mean he was very intimidated by it and he didn't he, he was daring himself by doing it because you know where's the script i said here it is oh good i said but you don't 
you're free to change it. I said, so what do you mean? I said, well, when you're actually shooting it, this is what story has to happen. But you can achieve this story yeah. as long as we've got you in the right clothing, that when you go through the door, you come out of the other door in the right clothing. Uh, you can, you know, you can find... And he got nervous because it was so open. And he loved it. He said at the end of the shoot that he felt like he knew for the first time, he felt for the first time like he had felt when he was a student in acting classes, the excitement of being an actor and of finding and yeah. stuff. Especially coming from TV with The Sopranos where it's very it's such, structured. Yeah, even though he was fucking great in that yeah. and it's a, it's a sensational part and I've got nothing against things that are structured like that. It's just not the way I like to work. I come from the studio, I come from Strasbourg, you know, but I also come from improvisational theater, from stand-up and stuff like that. I yeah. did, I did. So for me it's some sort of mixture of the moment and the through line of a person's personality or character, you know, and um, I mean, getting Orson to be Orson in was not as easy as you might think. He's never been Orson on film. He's always put on noses and everything and hid behind masks, as he so to get him in, in like I did in um, um, Someone to Love. No, in Someone to Love. Yeah was very tricky because he wanted to do it because he'd seen me in, in Always <laughs> and he said to me Jesus I thought he was I, I, I thought he was he said God how did he put it he said I want to I want to do that just once and I thought oh my God he loves this movie I was very excited <laughs> Orson Welles loves my movie he, I said oh you really? he said yeah yeah I like it a lot but that's not what I'm talking about he said I see you playing yourself warts and all crying being fucked up being an asshole I would like that once I'm always hiding behind masks I'm always you know so I said great the next movie uh, um, I keep forgetting the title of my own movie oh, someone's someone to love someone to love I just want you sitting in the back of the theater commenting on what's going on I'm playing a, a director who's going through and individuals who are at this point in their life will let they're alone not in a relation with somebody else and, and he said oh sure I'll do that and then he showed up in full makeup as a Greek with an accent, and I said, no, I had to trick him four times. And of course, you couldn't trick Austin. He wanted to be made to be allowed to show who he really was. Yeah. Which is why I love having someone to love out there, because if somebody wants to know who he is, you read the book, and you see someone to love, and you really get to know him. You know, you really get to know him. But that wasn't easy. He put out three. He said, "Okay, leave me alone for one hour." He just must have felt so vulnerable sometimes. He to even hated have his that nose. To... He said, "Look at this. Who cares?" Uh, and the same reason he boomed to people, and he did some of the obnoxious things like Richard Burton the thing with him in the book. Yeah, but the... it's really. <laughs> I, I kicked him under the table. He told me he didn't want. He didn't need a Jewish Jiminy Cricket. He said, "I don't need the Jewish conscience." He. he he, he, his insecurity, or his small nose, or whatever his issue was, f- felt that he had to create some intimidating persona, and he wasn't like that with me. So we were able to be so close because he never did that bullshit with me. Yeah. And therefore, what he really meant when he saw me playing this vulnerable person in Always, he said he'd like to show his own his own thing. You know, who, one son of film, and I, I got it. I mean, that's what I love about that. I got it. Yeah. So. And all the uh, philosophy that he has in the that's film his. and talking about really, yeah. that's all from, Absolutely. that wasn't script, that was all yeah. kind of his. I uh, said to him, you know the lunches we've had? All the lunches we've had, all I want is this to be like another lunch. I mean, we're talking about theater, actor, but whatever we're talking about, what you feel, what you believe, I wouldn't write a word for him at that point. Yeah. When he talks about uh, relationships and how they've evolved, it's so uh, it's, I mean, it's applicable to today. You know, so it uh, it it's so profound. It's, it's profound and yeah. it's eternal, and um, and it's and it's unique because it's his expression. You know. And he, he had a big thing about fat men shouldn't laugh on screen because it, it's, it's unattractive, which, of course, is nothing. When he, so he wouldn't laugh. So what happened was that he at the end of the movie, he said, I don't know if you know this, at the end of the... Do you know what I'm telling yeah, you? Where he sort of yells out, cut, or like... Uh, the he director. suddenly he says, yeah. he says, let's cut this. It's getting too sweet. <laughs> and I said, no, I'm not going to say cut, Orson. And he turns to my cameraman, who's been with me for seven, 12 movies now, the Israeli, my cam, Israeli cameraman, Hananya, and he says, well, I'm a director, I can say cut, and he looks into the camera and says, cut, and Hananya cuts. Yeah. And I screamed, Hananya, what are you doing? 
He said, Orson Welles told me to cut. <laughs> I said, I don't give a shit. This is my movie. And I turned it back on. But Orson didn't see me turning it back on. Yeah. And he reached behind him where he had a lit cigar. I don't know how he did that. A cigar lit behind him. Pulled it on. And everybody started applauding him. All the other actors and the crew. And he started laughing. And he wouldn't have done it if he'd known the camera was back on. Yeah. Didn't have that self-conscious... Uh... No. Not at all. And he's laughing. <laughs> and then I realized when... Uh, Five months later, I guess, six months later, he died. And I realized, boy, if he'd lived, I'd never be able to... I couldn't use this in the movie. But this is the best way to end this movie, to give Orson Welles his last laugh after 50 years of having to deal with all those people and being, you know, put all through all that shit. And it's a wonderful moment. I'm really... If I have to pick a moment in my film that I... Films that I just... I'm so happy yeah, exists. It's a very human, very natural... Uh, and he keeps laughing and... And then he blows me a kiss. That's a beautiful thing. Uh, he was a beautiful guy. Really beautiful man. I love that the book is out because, because people have so many illusions about him, you know? He created so much of it himself. Was, there's that whole sort of myth of him leaving films Not when they were in post-production. And, and, uh, having some kind of weird, yeah, all this stuff. Being difficult. and Difficult. That was sort of the... Yeah. And he was. You could see in, like how he dealt with that HBO woman. Yeah. It was outrageous. You saw that in the book, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, he. Uh, I mean, he had that opportunity there, but yet, since she seemed a little bit too uninterested, no. But it was you see, of, the uh, thing was that he got it. Yeah, I didn't get it at the time. He got that what she was saying was she wants half hour episodes and she's going to stay in control of the narrative. And he knew he couldn't work under those circumstances. He knew yeah. immediately it wasn't going to work. But you know, it's incredible watching like True Detective and all these great miniseries now. That would have been Orson Welles' uh, vehicle. The, the long he could have done form. ten episodes. And, yeah, hour long. and the long form. You know, yeah. I, uh, God. Ever since The Sopranos, I felt oh, if only Orson were alive. This is <laughs> this is made for him. This is what he wanted to try to do in film, which had no practical way of being. No, I just noticed us up there. It's so funny. I didn't. I forgot. <laughs> is that from uh, Safe Place? Yeah, that's yeah. In, uh, it's on, in Central Park. Yeah. Yeah, he was a sweet guy. Uh, I was just going to ask you one last question about uh, how you work with a cinematographer. Uh, with Hania Bear, do you... Uh, Hanania. Ha- Hanania, I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> do you have any shot lists going in? I know... No, no shot lists. Is there any sort of uh, visual conception that you have sometimes? Yeah, I say, I say look, uh, two cameras, yeah. uh, one on her and one on him. That's my vision. That's my uh, do high. It's more attractive. Yeah. Uh, try to follow that. Mainly follow the actors if they're walking and if they're going. If they surprise you. The reason I got them to begin with, when I got them after a few films, I guess almost oh, every one of your films you've used them in. Were, well, uh, I didn't use them in a safe place. Yeah. I, I had this big studio guy who, you know that story, right? The, yeah, he was. They were very kind of conservative. Uh, but you know, Orson. What Orson said to me there. He had tell him it's a dream sequence. That's, right, that's one of the great. <laughs> so I had that, and then on tracks I had a guy who was pretty good, but young and was good, and on sitting ducks. But then uh, I got Hananya on Always, and he was an army photographer, an Israeli army photographer, which meant to me, since he was an army photographer, he had to jump in and out of foxholes. He had to run after. The troops. Yeah. He could, he wasn't somebody who could. He wasn't about he, static he compositions. Need, yeah, he didn't need to like. He's never once had focus a tape, puller, or, focus yeah. puller, and f- all of that. And that suited my way of working, where I was saying to the actors, "I'm not telling you go here to here and then say this. Get into this here. You know the dialogue written. Say it and then go whenever you want direction, and and we'll follow you. Yeah. And that's that's uh, why I kept using him so much. I mean, I just love love that uh, that that feel of real life. I've just written a play, which is going to be opening in two months here, and so uh, the edge I took the editor away. Hmm? At the edge, the Edgemar, Yeah. 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 Uh, what is Good the play? What is the play about? Uh, it's called Train to Zakopane. Zakopane is a skiing resort in Poland. It takes place in the 1920s when a man, a young man, in his early 30s. Uh, going on a tra- who's Jewish, going on the train across Poland, meets a group of people uh, in the compartment, one of whom is a Polish nurse in the army, in the Polish army. And uh, the conversation comes around somehow to Jews, and one way or another they all prove to be vaguely anti-Semitic, but this particular girl says, 
uh, but she can smell a Jew a kilometer away. Mm. And this character, based upon my father, this is a true story, so what happened to my father? My father, in his very elegant words, in telling me the story three times over 30 years I have it taped, uh, he says, so I decided then and there that I, he that he didn't want to tell them he was Jewish because it would be uncomfortable. So they, 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 it was in the middle of a trial. They wouldn't yeah. do anything, but it was just would uh, arrest the church. So he, he said, "I can make better propaganda," as he called it, for the Jews by not being Jewish here and so on. But I decided that I will get off this train with the girl, yeah. and I will kiss the girl. Was his euphemism, and then tell her that I'm Jewish. It meant fuck the girl. Uh, and in fact, that's what happened. He flirted with her, convinced her, and they got off together at this Polish spa called Zakopane. And then things unfolded. But what unfolded, and why there's a play, is uh, they both got emotionally involved. So he kept putting off telling her. And she didn't know there was anything to know except she was falling in love. And then so that's it's a, it's a good it's a good play good story oh no, definitely I'm looking forward to carrying it around with me you know it's one of the when your father tells you a story since you were little yeah it was his it was his story that he always described as the thing he liked least about what he did in his life the one time my very sure of himself father decided he did something that wasn't completely correct yeah. well, in fact you know it was quite correct did you ever intend to write it as a film? No, never even or, occurred to me. Really? Never even occurred to me. What happened is that Tana Frederick, who is now my wife and has been my girlfriend for 12 years, um, and I've made six movies with her and f- five, five or six plays, um, I hadn't had a, a, a play in eight months. It was going cuckoo. We kept reading plays, trying to find plays. We almost committed to one, did take one under option, just wasn't really good enough. And she just come off a year's run in The Rainmaker, where she got glowing, extraordinary reviews. She's the star of this one. And um, I suddenly thought, I, I want to have a better writer a play. <coughs> She's going to go nuts if she doesn't get a play. And I was going over my... I've been working for a year on a book for a year. How many years, Lauren? Uh, I don't know if Lauren can hear you. Ten, no, she can. Ten, ten years, eleven years. Yeah on a book called uh, The Third Stone on the Fourth Row, A Brief History of the Jewish People. No less, it's like a presumptuous title. But so so um, I thought, and in there is the story. In the most story general, and your father had told you this many years ago. Yeah, yeah. And, it, and it was in this book that I already was coming to the editing stage of. As like a page, a page and a half, in a 400 page 500 page book but suddenly I came across I thought that that nurse is a good part for Tana and we'll find we'll cast a guy to play my father and with these other people and I've I've never written anything as easily and I've never had anything we'll see what happens when it opens but I've never had anything so responded to by everybody who's read it it was like waiting to be read it's a good feeling how do you uh, work in uh, in a theater Process different from filmmaking. Completely different. Because filmmaking is so spontaneous, and you're there and you're filming like right at the moment. And, whereas in and, theater, you're rehearsing so much. Right. And, get that. And well, I'm not rehearsing. I don't direct the theater. Oh, you're not directing. No, I uh, never do that. No, I haven't done that since since college. Um, no, for theater, I like to write, and as opposed to movies where I believe in improvisation, and I encourage actors to bring a lot of themselves, and frequently what they give me that is not in the script is more exciting for me, more spo- you know, spontaneous and more amazing. And I end up using more of that yeah. uh, in the finished movie. They tell me that I'm, in plays that I've written, I'm some kind of pathetic stickler who can't stand it if they ch- change one like word or vowel. You know, if it's not what I wrote. Sort of the other side of the coin. Completely, uh, because I am, of all the director, uh, all the filmmakers, I think, ever. I mean, there may be some experimental crazy somewhere, but I'm the only one who I really, I I completely allow the actors to go. And once I've got the storyline and the structure and how you got from this to through the door, you know, so therefore I have to know what clothing they're wearing. But basically... I'm very alive during the process to, to what the actors give and creating the movie f- frequently. Uh, 
um, if not out of that, colored enormously by that, by their contributions. But here, I don't want any contributions. I want, I want them to play. I, I, I write it. I rewrite it. I'm still pashkin with it, and uh, I want it to be uh, what I wrote. So uh, Tana pointed out to me what, what it, you know two plays ago what a difference. I hadn't even realized that, but it's it's the two most opposite kind of behaviors in terms of uh, my feeling about the writing. I've noticed in so many of your films, uh, you tend to use one location or sort of yeah. cluster in locations. Yeah. So when you're writing a screenplay, do you have in mind this is my budget? I really have to limit what my canvas is in a sense I, I don't uh, my writing isn't related to that my decision of location is the reason there's so many in one centralized location is because half of movie making is picking you know companies yeah. up uh, crews and actors and moving them and getting them settled and doing that for three days on location and worrying about location so I, I write movies trying to find centralized location stories I mean specifically um, like I think of like New Year's Day. Well, New Year's Day was in my apartment then in New York uh, that I had just moved into, so it was an empty apartment in New York. Uh, uh, I don't know if you saw Always about the end of my first marriage. Yeah, that was at it was your entirely home. Entirely at the yeah. house she and I had lived in, and now we were going through a divorce in that house. I never in that film, like in New Year's Day, never left. Part of the game for me then was okay. I'm not going to even do an external shot. I'm not allowed to. <laughs> once I've tried this discipline and it also creates a certain kind of um, it gives energy uh, to centralize the physical location so much of movie making has to do with the use which is beautiful and I can enjoy it Lawrence of Arabia you know you can go out there and yeah. shoot the world and make it very gorgeous and, but for me since my films are about people and about their relationships and their emotions the, the more I'm not distracted by my environment the more it's not oh isn't that pretty and look at that you know, the more it's about people in a location being forced to confront themselves and yeah. their emotions. And you can the, focus the in on the performance and and emotionally, making that, and yeah. emotionally, it, it puts people in a totally different place uh, than if they have space. And it, you can, you know, I, I I come from the actor's studio and Lee Strasberg, and that that way of working, which is organic and. Dostoy- uh, Stanislavski and all of that which which really is from the instrument of the actor I'm very much an actor as director so I want their instruments to be as focused as as open to to their insides but not to be affected by their outsides you know to be yeah. affected by the story and the emotions and what they bring to it so I found that single locations economically make the movie much more possible with within my kind of range of filmmaking and also f- sort of force actors into a place where it is about them and not, uh, you know, going off, you, you can't resist yeah. if you're making another kind of film and showing something, a landscape, or it doesn't, so I'm much more interested in people. Yeah. It's almost what, like, Ingmar Bergman would do, where you would really focus I in on... I was hugely influenced by that. I was hugely influenced by Bergman in terms of locations. And in terms of emotional confrontations between men and women, yeah, huge. And Fellini, who was my other big influence, uh, it was about looking at yourself and being willing to centralize a film frequently in yourself. You know, like an eight and a half. Yeah. What do you think has been the proudest moment of your career, hmm. or a project that you feel that you're the most proud of? Well, proud, proud isn't maybe the word, but. As I look at it, I'm, I'm enormously impressed with myself about the insanity of having made Always. When I think about, you know, the pain yeah. I was in at the time, and then deciding, and again, Orson. And your real ex-wife was... Uh, yes, and we were going through it, there. and I thought some... Uh, and every day, what ha- would happen is we'd arrive... Like it was, we were back home. I shot it in the house we lived in. And you were living at the house. I was living alone there. She had left. So now she came back to make the movie. And we're waiting, and then the crew comes, and then the actors come, and then we have lunch. And it's like we're having guests at the house. And we're putting on a little party. Oh, it's a movie. And then we shoot the scene, and we shoot it. And then at nighttime, the actors leave, and the, the, you know, and the crew leaves, and then she leaves. And I said, well, do you really want to, do you want to, you know? 
So I, it's like being left over and over and over again, and every day setting it up like being back together. Yeah. And it was it was I'm so I'm I don't know if impressed is the word or uh, I should be institutionalized, but it, it was it's an astonishing thing. But I I just really love the truthfulness of what I get from actors and I like my films very much because they are my films you love them or you hate them and there are plenty of people in both categories I never have to compromise and uh, I am able to make them for for myself basically for what I think you know like you do in any other art form nobody's surprised that a painter does that or a musician yeah. but film they always think has to have some commercial dimension to it and being compromised for, for that and Orson taught me you know may, never make a film for anybody else he said because you know event, eventually nobody knows what works going to work anyway commercially and you have to live with it for the rest of your life he said the worst thing that he felt was the films he saw that he had uh, let the producers convince him to do something that he didn't want to do and now they're down there and, and having that fear oh the producers are going to think this or that and not yeah, you know, all putting of that, in that all of that so the freedom has been... And that's Birch, thanks to Birch Schneider spoiling me like that in my first movie. So suddenly I felt I can make movies in this Hollywood system. Yeah, which was surprisingly a, a studio movie of Columbia that, Pictures. That's my only studio yeah. movie. I mean, it's very bizarre. And, he, you know, the circumstances in life vary, but there are always in somebody's life a moment, a kind of critical moment, when you make certain kind of choices. You may know why, you may not even know why, that, that define you, especially as an artist, that define you for the rest of your life if you stay with them. And the people who've had trouble, it seems to me, are the ones who have not stuck to that. And they've wanted to and they haven't. Many, many friends of mine stopped directing, stopped, you know, because they got told no or they, you know, I think of a career like Bob Rafelson, who I consider was a great director. Yeah, I mean, Five Easy Pieces, one of my favorite films. Mine too, I, mine yeah. too. And he's he was uh, brilliant and... He got into a fight with a studio at this one film, and uh, they sent a guy down, and he threw a chair or something, and that's the end of the career. Because, and I've, I used to say to him all the time, well, "You don't have to make movies that way, this way." He said, "But where's the, you know, they all they all want that big scope yeah, and and that big, you know, f- f- payment." Yeah, they get used to that. So that's why the hope always is with kids who are struggling to make their early films, because they are free. They don't yet know that you can't do this and you can't do that. And, and also, the new economics are great because you can make a film now and, and show it. And again, suddenly, it's like you can show it to all your friends uh, you know, uh, on the Internet. 